all, we are continuing on in our series called CrossFit, all right, and we're talking about spiritual disciplines, right? So disciplining ourselves in certain ways to become more like Jesus. A discipline in and of itself is not the, the be-all and end-all. It's not about disciplines. Oh, look at me, I've got 10 disciplines. I must be like Jesus. No, that's not it, Okay. The disciplines are practices that we put in our life in order to help us to become more like Jesus. If you don't need the disciplines to be just like Jesus, more power to you, I want to have coffee with you. All right? Shed some, some wisdom with me if you could. Dallas Willard, uh, I'm going to be quoting him anytime I preach on spiritual disciplines because he just seems to be one of the... Uh, the Christ followers who's been able to, to really understand and sort of give shape and form and understanding uh, to this concept of spiritual disciplines. He said, and he lists the, the discipline we're looking at this morning is celebration as one of the top disciplines that we need to have as Christians, as people who are following Jesus. Not only did he say it's one of the highest disciplines that we need to practice, but he said it's often the most misunderstood. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to leave today understanding any greater or not, but at least you can go away understanding. It's a hard one to understand, okay? Maybe that's what we're going to get this morning. I'm not sure. Celebration um, is difficult to practice with authenticity. We, we want to gather, we want to understand celebration, and it's something that, that we think about at times as Christians. It's certainly something that our, our society at large um, seems to enter into at times and is trying to understand and what's fascinating to me is psychology is telling us what jesus was teaching us two thousand years ago that grateful people make for better people <laughs> that's the reality of it grateful joyous people make for better neighbors make for better employees make for better husbands and wives and grandparents and children it says grateful people studies tell us that grateful people 25 percent uh, receive a 25 percent spike in alertness and energy and it says that they sleep better people who take hardship head on it says increases our well-being versus avoiding and running away so this idea of joy, gratitude, and celebration is not just when always life is wonderful and life is good because life is not always wonderful and life is not always good. Life can be hard. But the biographies that we read, the movies that we see, the stories that we hear that challenge us so incredibly, aren't they the ones where someone who is facing hardship is somehow able to face it head on and is to find joy and gratitude and ways to celebrate in the midst of something that just seems like not a hope in the world, right? Those are the stories that inspire us. Listen, Jesus understood and he reminded us that we will experience hard times in our life here on earth. Yet in those opportunities, uh, sorry, those struggles, there is opportunity. There's opportunity for gratitude. There's opportunity for joy. Gratitude and joy makes it easier to cope with trauma and stress. If you are a person who, who you know, on the, the spectrum, if you like, tends to be more of a, a positive, a grateful, more joyful person, you will be able to handle stress and trauma in a more healthy way than those who are on the other side of that spectrum. These are things that we're discovering in our world today, in the social sciences. These are things that Jesus has been telling us for a couple thousand years. It's not going to be easy, as Dallas Willard said. Robert Hughes wrote a book that we live in the culture of complaint. <laughs> I think that's pretty true. The culture of complaint. That's not a wonderful thing to uh, nickname our culture as. But you see, at large, we're not a people who choose to see the glass half full. We're not a people who are overwhelmingly content. We're not a people who are filled with thankfulness. We 
tend to default to cynicism. And I just want to put it out there this morning. I think you get this. That is just too easy. Cynicism's just too easy. And it sours you and it sours those people around you. Now this morning we're going to look at uh, what Dr. Luke wrote for us. Dr. Luke, who understood people maybe better than others as being a doctor, understood how people think and, and all, he shared some teaching of Jesus in Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, there are three stories that, that Jesus shared, uh, spoke back to back to back, and, and Luke shared these stories with us. And we're going to look at the element in these stories, and we're going to focus in on the third story there. And it's this concept, as I've already initiated, this, this idea of celebration and the challenge of joy and the challenge of gratitude. In, in this, this teaching, we've got the story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then the last story is about the lost son. Now, some of you know the story. As I said, it's in Luke chapter 15, and we will be looking at uh, verses 17 down to verse 32. But initially, let me just sort of open the story up for you a little bit. The story starts, as you may remember, as the son goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance. This is the younger son, by the way. I want my inheritance. Now, you may or may not have heard that in that culture, that was as if you were saying, I want you dead, Dad. That, that's what it was saying to the dad. You're dead to me. I want my inheritance. So the dad got everything together, the, the documents, the papers, the hard, you know, tangible cash, right? Handed it over to the son. And we read the story, and we understand that the son went, son went off and, and lived a, a riotous, just amazingly, in theory, from the outside, celebratory life. But then his life came crashing down. We pick up the story when the son was beginning to realize that he had made a massive mistake. Luke 15, 17 to 32. Speaking of the son, when he came to his senses, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and stay with him. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went off to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Well, your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Where do you see yourself in that story? Do 
Do you side with anybody? What, what do you feel when you hear that story? Is it too familiar? Have you, have you lost the sense of what the story is? Do you understand the, the younger son and why he went to his dad? Like, do you understand how the father could do what he did? Or does it make sense, the, the older brother's response? Where, where do you see yourself? What started resonating maybe deep in your soul or your mind as, as you heard that story once again? This is a powerful story, and there is a lot here. But as we talked about last week, there is a phrase that is a reality that, that does not allow you to serve. And it's a phrase and a reality that crushes joy, and that's the whole word entitlement. Are you catching the theme? Entitlement crushes joy. The son felt entitled. He felt, hey, why not now? Why do I have to wait till the old man's dead? I, I want it now. Come on, Dad, let's have it. I mean, these traditions, they're silly. Let me, let me have it now. Felt entitled. And that entitlement led him to often into this, this, this self-absorbed party world. But did he really have joy in the midst of all of that? Did he? No. No, he didn't. He wanted his inheritance now. And what he discovered was there was some fun. There, there was some celebration for sure, for sure, but there was no peace, joy, and contentment long term at all. There was no ability to carry on with this celebration. What we discover is, is that his entitlement led him to a quick de-escalation, like he had made a massive mistake. He'd squandered it. Brief moments of fun and pleasure. However, nothing was quite enough. The now and its mine did not serve him well. It brought him to quick ruin. And you see, there's sort of two moments in, in the son's life where we can learn from him. What he had was not enough. And so he went to his father, and he wanted more. I want it now. But then when he had it all, he discovered that wasn't enough either. And so the son is, is teaching us and reminding us that we need to learn how to be grateful, how to find joy, and how to celebrate in what we have right now rather than the sense of entitlement that I need more, that I should be getting this, and I should be getting that. Henry Nouwen writes that gratitude goes beyond mine and claims the truth that all of life is a pure gift. And that until we get to that point... We will never be content. We will never be grateful people. We will never find joy. And we will never truly be able to celebrate. Another said that grateful living is vital. Becoming aware that every moment is a gift that we have received and to be lived in. It's vital. It's crucial to our experience of life. Now you see, the young son, after uh, he had squandered his inheritance, the light kind of came on. He had been humbled. His mindset, his understanding of what he maybe had and didn't have was completely rewritten. And he owned it. And he embraced it. How do we know that? Because he practiced, he 
he realized what he should say to his father when he came back. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to be called a son any longer. Just, just let me serve along with the other servants. And when he embraced it, his life was changed forever. More than he could, could ever imagine. So that's, that's the younger son. Entitlement uh, crushed him. Completely thrashed him. Now we come to the older brother. When the light shines on him in this story, it's not pretty. But he asked the questions that, frankly, when I read that story, even though I know the ending and I know how I'm supposed to respond, I would be asking similar questions probably. Why? Don't you understand, Dad? Are you kidding me? I've never done that. And you've never done this. Like, all of that makes some sense to me. But you see, I know in my own life what the older brother knew in his life, what you may or may not know in your life, that when we go down that road, it's ugly. It's ugly. This was a great day. This was an amazing day. The son who had completely lost his mind had gone off and got all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, in the name of fun and all those, but, but it just it squandered it all. Like, it just wasted. This is a great day. He was coming home, but the older son could not see it. And when you could not see it, he could not experience it, and he could not enter into it. You see, envy, this is what this... This brother was going through. He was envious. And envy, if you like, is the kryptonite to celebration. He, he, he wanted what the younger brother had done. He wanted the celebration for himself. He, couldn't, he could not celebrate with someone else because he felt like he deserved it. And when we're envious, we can never celebrate we can never truly be happy and, and joyful in, in the celebration with other people why because we feel like somehow no that was should be for me envy and entitlement really are close cousins if you'd like they, they play well together they just don't play well for us what's in it for me I mean, I've been the good one. But entitlement and envy are absolutely destructive. And they never lead us to joy. They never lead us to gratitude. They lead us to bitterness. Let's look at the dad. Now, the dad... Right? The son, I want my inheritance, death to you. You are dead to me. There's a sense in the writing of this story that the father was, was going out on a daily basis and just kind of looking out with anticipation that at some point this son was going to, to come home. And what we get and what we understand and what we realize is that this dad somehow in the midst of like this horrible situation where his son had completely abandoned him and had spoken death on his head, if you like, somehow he was still expectant. And he was excited about the possibility of his son returning. How do we know that? Why? Because when the son shows up, he's like, party time let's get the robe let's get the ring let's get the fatted calf bring everyone together my son is home and i can tell you that that attitude did not switch just when he saw the son that was an attitude that had been developed within this father you see Joy, gratitude, 
and celebration are choices we have to, better yet, get to make. Paul in Philippians chapter 4 said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He, he didn't say, you know, because of all of these things. No, no, it was a command. He didn't say, when you feel like it, do this. No, it was a teaching for us to obey. For us to follow. One of the things that I, uh, people often ask me, so, so why did you end up coming back to Sanish? Like, what, what was that all about? What did you see? What did you notice in coming back? You know, one of the very first things I noticed was a higher level um, of anticipation in prayer for what God could do. And one of the things I noticed in Steve that, that I had not seen previously, or not, not that I had not seen it, the words I had not heard before, but it had obviously become a very definite practice within his life. And he regularly practices Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. Today. Today is the day I'm going to live in, and I will rejoice. I don't know what's coming, but I'm going to figure out how to live in the joy of the Lord in the midst of this day, come what may. It's a declaration for us to choose. Galatians chapter 5 is a section of verses in there that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. We talked a little bit about this last week, this idea that as we keep in step with the Spirit, as we, as we live following, if you like, and, and listening to the promptings of the Spirit, as, we, as we're doing this, as we're you know, walking alongside with Jesus, um, the character of God is going to become developed within our life. Love, yes. Oh, wait a second, joy joy ask Steve before the service because he's married to Sarah and Sarah is uh, I, I would say bilingual hey yeah she's bilingual looked like a French name wasn't sure how to pronounce it we're going with Brene is that right Brene Brown Brene Brown spent 12 years working and studying and trying to understand this concept of joy and gratitude and what that looks like. Twelve years, 11,000 different separate pieces of data. And the thing that she discovered was that no one was joyful or was thought to be joyful or was described as being joyful. No one was who did not have a practice of gratitude. Not just that they were grateful every once in a while, that they had built in actual practices, disciplines in their life to be grateful. They, they, just, they didn't leave it just to chance. They didn't just leave it for, you know, the good days. No, these these men and these women put into their life disciplines of gratitude. It was active. It was, it was a daily practice. So her conclusion was practicing gratitude invites joy into our life. Maybe Jesus was on to something. So we need to consider, what are some definable, practical activities that we can build into our lives around gratitude? I mean, we're talking about disciplines here, things that we can build into our life so that we can become more like Christ, more joyful, more grateful, more about celebration. So I want to share with you just a, just a whole random bunch of different ways that you can do this. I want to go back to the Hebrew people. The Hebrew people, devout Hebrews, three times a day, 
would recite 18 benedictions three times a day, things that they were thankful for, things that they were grateful for in the morning, at noon, and at night. 18. That's 54 different things every day. Now, I'm sure they repeated them over time, but they had a practice of three times a day. They would pull out, they would set aside their smartphones, right? And they'd be grateful. And they'd, be, they'd leave the cynicism aside. They'd leave the entitlement aside. They'd leave the, I wish I had that aside. And they were grateful. Three times. Eighteen. At each one of those sessions. That seems like a, I'll be honest, that seems like a lot. <laughs> but they knew they needed it. That, that's the thing. 16th century there became a prayer called the prayer of examine or examine I'm not sure <laughs> see at the end of every day what, what this prayer of examine was all about was this idea of reflecting on the day just looking back and just being thankful for the things that they experienced things that they went through the little joys that they experienced. They were asking questions, when did you feel most connected to the Creator? When did you feel most joy during the day? And they were grateful for it. And they were thankful. And you see, what this practice did was it, it allowed you to see both the big and the little things that you could examine and you could see and you could be grateful for. In my studying and reading and, and research, if you like, I came across the story of a, of a woman who had faced just an incredible amount of, of tragedy, you know, losing children and, and nieces and nephews, and just it was just one of these, these lives where it was just tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And it started to get to her, obviously, and it was hard. But a trusted friend and her were talking about this, and... Uh, this friend said, you know what? Maybe what you should do is write down a thousand things that you're thankful for, that you're grateful for. I mean, not ten, not a hundred, but a thousand. Like, that's just, that's a lot. But you know what happened? I mean, didn't sit down and do it in one writing. But you know what? It was discernible. The difference from that day when that person started that to within the days, weeks, and months later of how this person became more of a joyful, contented, grateful, celebratory person. Practices, disciplines of being grateful. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do you realize when Paul wrote that in, in Philippians chapter 4? Paul was in prison. Now, I need you to get your mind out of the kind of prisons that you saw, you see in the little papers that maybe the kids bring home from Sunday school. I need you to get your mind out of some sort of sanitary place. I want you to think Les Miserables, right? Those dark dungeons, you know, the Mask of Zorro, if, you, if you're old enough to remember that one. Those dungeons, right, where everything, <laughs> some of you just went there. I just saw your faces where you were going, ew, yes. Little critters running around. Water and other things running around. And he's writing, Rejoice in the Lord. Again I say rejoice. And some of us might think, that dude's got a mental illness. You know what? If so, I want that. I mean, that's what that's where the studies are showing us today. That's what Jesus has been teaching us for, for centuries now. I mean, Mother Teresa, I mean, we would go to her, it was, it was spoken of her, how she had just this, this sense of joy in the midst of all of the pain. Like, how could she do that? And she said, my joy is in the Lord. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Second World War dude, uh, pastor, lived in, um, in Germany 
jailed because of his stance for Jesus, spoke of his joy. Pages of history, men, women, and, and children who have chosen gratitude and joy and celebration. My question for you is, will you choose that? Will you practice that? I mean, I've just listed off a few. One of, the, one of the people, they said, you know, after every meal, after they pray for the meal, they'll just, as they're starting eating, they'll just say, hey, what are you thankful for today? What are you grateful for today? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You've seen the table here. Hebrews chapter 12 calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus, author, perfecter of our faith. It says in there, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There it is again. And so we will be pausing to take the bread and we will take the juice in joy of what Jesus has done for us. Can you celebrate that? I hope that you will.